Egypt, queen of the Nile, stands at the world's crossroads. From the days of the pharaohs, her colossal, enigmatic monuments have looked down upon a succession of foreign rulers. Corrupt and corrupting, they degraded her people in the eyes of the world. The Suez Canal, opened in 1869, brought new life, but it also brought new conquerors, more battles. In the Second World War, Egypt was again fought over, and once again, the sand covered the pain of humiliation and defeat. But out of this war came a new leader who gave new hope, new aspirations. He was a people's pharaoh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. came to revolutionary leadership through military service. The son of a postal worker, he had joined in demonstrations as a schoolboy. In the army, his seriously intense personality showed he had marked qualities of leadership. He was only 34 when he came to power, but he quickly became the wildly acclaimed hero of his fellow countrymen. Leaders great and small sought him out all no doubt with their own interests in mind, or such is the nature of international power politics. And Nasser created for his own people a spectacle of power which resembled the dreams of all dictators. Nasser was the first true Egyptian to hold true power in Egypt for more than 2,000 years. And one of his major ambitions reawaken the sense of Egyptian consciousness, identity, to revive a sense of pride and self-respect. When I first met Gamal Abdel Nasser, I was greatly impressed by his quiet charm, his dignity, and his commanding presence. But the most impressive thing was the reaction of the Egyptians in the room. There was a great buildup of tension and expectation, as though some godlike figure were about to, to arrive on the scene. The Egyptians had turned Nasser into a sort of new pharaoh. They saw in him qualities that he did not have, and they expected from him deeds that he would be unable to perform. As he looked back over Egypt's melancholy history, Nasser saw in his imagination a role which was waiting for its hero. Previous actors in this historical drama were unworthy of the role. Nasser's contemporary, the young King Farouk, was the descendant of an Albanian adventurer who had wrested power from the Turks. But Farouk ruled under the thumb of the British. Although under the 36th Treaty, Egypt was a so-called fully sovereign nation, the fact was that Britain still dominated Egypt's life. Egypt had very little to say about its own affairs. Although the Egyptians thrived economically under the British and built up huge reserves of sterling, they still resented the British presence because they had to subordinate their own national interests to those of another country. For a proud and nationalist officer like Nasser, it was frightful to hear some young lieutenant shout abuses at the Egyptian soldiers as wogs or what have you. 
In the Second World War, Egyptian nationalists eagerly awaited the victory of Erwin Rommel, Hitler's favorite general, as his Africa Corps advanced towards the Nile. But their hopes were dashed by Montgomery's counteroffensive at El Alamein. For Britain, Egypt was a vital strategic base. King Farouk was presented with a British ultimatum, toe the line or quit the throne. For Nasser, it was the worst humiliation of all and the start of his active plans for revolution. The worthlessness of Farouk and all he stood for became more blatant after the World War when Egypt was defeated by the infant Israeli state in Palestine. Nasser himself was a brave soldier. He and his secret organization of free officers felt betrayed by Farouk's corrupt regime. By July 1952, their plans were ready. Early one morning, they struck against the king. Farouk's life was spared and he went into exile, never to return. Nasser's moment had arrived. He didn't want to identify himself at first as the leader. Why still is matter of some mystery. He said that it was because of his age. He was only 34 years old. And yet the king was younger than he was. So they chose a very respected officer, General Naguib, to head the regime, to be the figurehead. Nasser remained in the background. Gradually, as differences with Naguib began to uh, develop, he felt it necessary to push himself to take over posts, like the Minister of Interior, and then he became Deputy Prime Minister. Then he became Prime Minister and he lost out to Naguib and again became Prime Minister. And finally, after a terrible quarrel, they put Naguib under house arrest and Nasser took full power in public view. Nasser was quickly disillusioned by the response of the Egyptians to his revolution. Every man we questioned had nothing to recommend except to kill someone else, he complained. Every idea we listened to was nothing but an attack on some other idea. He would have to work out his own ideas, and in doing so, disappoint many who trusted him. Nasser was a, a gifted leader in appearance and in behavior, and also because of his quiet way, he inspired trust in people. People genuinely believed that he, he had integrity and that he had a desire to build a new country, to reform, to purge the old. They did trust him, but after a few experiences, many began to discover that their trust was misplaced. People who had frequent contact with Nasser began to describe him as a talented liar. He could receive very important foreign leaders and they would leave in a glow of enthusiasm because they thought they had his word on something and would be disappointed to discover later that it wasn't so. No one was to be more affected by this discovery than the British statesman Antony Eden. As Foreign Secretary, Eden negotiated Britain's final departure from Egypt. For some 75 years, Britain had held sway over the Suez Canal. Now, Nasser was free to pursue his own heroic role. He wanted modern weapons, and the Russians agreed to supply them, using Czechoslovakia as a cover. Britain and America were shocked by what seemed like a sudden desertion to the communist side in the Cold War. They withdrew their support from the Aswan Dam a huge project to harness the waters of the Nile worthy of a new feral. NASA responded by nationalizing the Suez Canal. Its revenues would help pay for the dam. The move was hugely popular in Egypt and the Arab world, but the Western maritime nations regarded it as a breach of faith. Antony Eden was now Britain's prime minister 
and determined to break Nasser. Some people say Colonel Nasser has promised not to interfere with shipping passing through the canal. Why therefore don't we trust him? Well, the answer is simple. Look at his record. Our quarrel is not with him, still less with the Arab world. It is with Colonel Nasser. When he gained power in Egypt, we felt no hostility towards him. But instead of meeting us with friendship, Colonel Nasser conducted a vicious propaganda campaign against our country. He has shown he is not a man who can be trusted to keep an agreement. In October 56, Britain and France launched a military strike against Nasser, whom Eden saw as a dictator like the dictators he had faced in the 30s. An essential part of the plan was an Israeli attack across the Sinai Desert, which succeeded brilliantly. The Egyptian army collapsed, and Nasser's pride was laid in the dust. Ostensibly, Britain and France acted to isolate the Suez Canal from the conflict, but the intervention of the two former colonial powers enabled Nasser to pose as the injured party. President Eisenhower was outraged, and Dulles, whose tortuous diplomacy had largely contributed to the crisis, organized world opinion in support of a United Nations peacekeeping force. The Soviets threatened to send volunteers and talked about rockets. In the end, it was Britain and France who were humiliated. Eden had to make the best of it. The formation of a United Nations force could be the turning point in the history of the United Nations. Does anyone suppose that there would have been a United Nations force but for British and French action? Of course not. I am convinced, more convinced than I've been about anything in all my public life, that we were right, my colleagues and I, in the judgment and the decision we took, and that history will prove it so. In everybody's eyes, it was Nasser who had won. Soon after, Eden resigned, his health having given way under the strain. Now, can I just say, thank you very much for all your kindness to me, all of you, during my period of office. I wish my successor all good fortune and God speed to you all. Goodbye. Nasser had shown you could kick the imperialists in the seat of the pants and get away with it. The entire Arab world reacted in rapture and enthusiasm. His speeches were broadcast by Radio Cairo throughout the Arab world and Arabs in tents and Arabs in apartments and Arabs in rich villas listened intently because here was their deliverer, their new leader. And many of the things that he did, like the union with Syria in 1958, were against, uh, were against his own better judgment. But he yielded uh, too often to the push of the masses. After Suez, Nasser was at the peak of his power. But already his policies had turned Egypt backwards. And the future was to bring nothing but trouble. Nasser came to power with no ideological commitments. He was easily influenced by others, like Tito of Yugoslavia. Nasser said that uh, there was no place for Marxism in the Arab world because of its doctrine of atheism and its, uh, co its concept of class struggle, its position against private property, and various other things. He felt that he was using the Soviet Union for Egypt's good, buying weapons where he could obtain them because he needed them, getting economic assistance to build the Aswan Dam because that's the only place he could get it, accepting the factories, accepting uh, trade that was somewhat to the disadvantage of Egypt, but all for what he felt was Egypt's good. And on occasion, he would express great disdain for the Russian leadership. And when someone would ask him about the burden of debts to the Soviet Union, he would say, well, it's the debtor who has the advantage because it's the person who's trying to get his money back who's always worried as to whether he will or not. Nasser's dependence on Soviet aid for projects like the Aswan Dam 
set back Egypt's economic development. He was also persuaded to undertake socialization measures, which the Egyptians hated. To silence critics, Nasser resorted to police repression and concentration camps. Perhaps here, too, he was following the advice of others. In the poorest villages and refugee camps, it was the Arabs themselves who suffered most from Nasser's posture as a revolutionary hero. As the Western newsreels put it, Egypt had become the dark center of poisonous propaganda and subversion. In 1958, King Faisal of Iraq was murdered in an army coup which was thought to have been inspired by Nasser. King Faisal and his cousin, King Hussein of Jordan, had tried to form an alliance to counter Nasser's union with Syria. Hussein himself narrowly escaped a similar fate. Nasser was a commanding figure among the Arabs because of what he had done in 1956. He had strong following among the Arab peoples, so all the leaders had to keep this in mind, and they tried to avoid any direct and public confrontation with him. So even if they despised him, they uh, would put on a good show of embracing at the airport. And many did despise him. He was not only a rival of power, but his agents were actively meddling in the internal affairs of places like Saudi Arabia, where assassination attempts were uh, laid to Nasser's police and the various inspiration for coups were cooked up by the Egyptians. Nasser liked to think of Cairo as being the natural center of the third world. He was in his element, acting as host to men like Sukarno of Indonesia and China's Chou Enlai. He thrived on it. He saw it as beneficial to Egypt to be able to play uh, the big powers and uh, perhaps also as just a human response of a certain sense of gratification after all these years to be able to take the spotlight away from the big power leaders. Egypt gained nothing by Nasser's outward show of power. First, Syria broke from the United Arab Republic. Then Nasser involved Egypt in the costly civil war in the Yemen, which darkened Egypt's reputation as a result of the use of poison gas by Egyptian troops. But no one challenged Nasser's leadership. He had that quality of leadership. And that's why so many things went wrong for Egypt, because they followed him into uh, places they didn't really want to go, and they encountered defeat after defeat. In six days in 1967, Israel proved that she, and not Egypt, was the dominant power in the Middle East. No one can really be certain what happens in a battle or in a war. I think the Israelis were genuinely frightened in May, in the first days of June, 1967. Nasser had blundered into the worst humiliation of his career. Yet his hold over his fellow Egyptians remained intact. Nasser really demonstrated his uh, political genius after the 67 defeat because he turned it into a personal triumph. As Egypt lay in ruins and humiliation, he offered his resignation to turn over power, probably knowing full well that uh, he wouldn't be allowed to do so. Nasser yielded to the cry of the masses. He would remain as Egypt's savior. But he was a different man. Chastened and wiser, he sought a way to end the long feud with Israel. In the bitter war of attrition which followed the 67 defeat, Egypt gained nothing but casualties, while hardline Arab states goaded the Egyptians to fight on.
By a brilliant maneuver, Nasser exposed the false position of other Arab states and opened the way for an approach to Israel, going over the head of the Palestinian leader, Yasser Arafat. Nasser's decision to accept a ceasefire on the canal uh, provoked uh, an outburst uh, in the Arab world, and particularly from the Palestinians, who saw their cause as being undermined. They resorted to violence, hijacking airliners. They blew up an American uh, 747 on the runway at Cairo. There was fighting, bitter, savage fighting in Jordan between Palestinians and the Jordanian army. And Nasser succeeded in a brilliant manner in bringing Arab leaders together and solving the Jordan conflict. Through patience, even though he was very weak and dying, and his usual winning and convincing manner, using the authority of Egypt, he managed to arrange a settlement between King Hussein and Yasser Arafat. It was his best moment, and he was still being acclaimed throughout the Arab world the next day when he died. There was something very Egyptian about Nasser's funeral, where more than 40 people died. The people expressed their grief and despair, to be sure, but beneath there was also, perhaps, a sense of relief. Within a few months of Nasser's death, his successor, Anwar Sadat, began to chisel Nasser's name like an ancient pharaoh out of the monuments that he had raised. He undid much that Nasser had done. He reversed the policy of hostility toward the West and friendship to the East. He revised the socialist economic nature of the economy, and uh, he curbed the hated Nasser secret police. And most importantly, he moved to a peace treaty with Israel. In all this, Sadat had the overwhelming support of the Egyptian people. Where does this leave Nasser's place in history? It is still too early to tell. The last act must still be played out.